Hi, I'm Amir Whitaker. I'm an actress, print model, mentor, and I'm a social activist. I am Michael Brown. I am Tamir Rice. I am Trayvon Martin. I am Ferguson. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. 36436 is brought to you by The Late Night Experiment with Motown Maurice. Subscribe today on YouTube. I grew up in Chester, Pennsylvania. It's a small little city right outside of Philadelphia. It's about five to 10 miles south, um, a small inner city. And ever since I was young, I just always knew that I wanted to be a part of the progress of the black community. I knew I wanted to have an impact on the black community in a positive way. I remember when I was really young, um, I think it was like kindergarten, when I first heard about Harriet Tubman, and I was just amazed by her, I was amazed by her story, by how she, after she freed herself, she went back and continued to free more people. I just loved it, that mentality, and I knew that I wanted to be of similar character to her. Around the age of 10 years old, I was in a play, I grew up in theater, and they were asking each and every last one of us in the cast, what did we want to be when we grew up? And I remember telling them that I wanted to be one of the black people from during the civil rights movement, essentially a social activist. And that was pretty much where I believe my yearning to be a social activist began. Power to the people! The journey really began for me during this incident during my childhood of this young kid around in my area, in my neighborhood. He was just sitting on his porch and there was this lady, this white lady coming into the neighborhood to pick up drugs. And she was trying to, I guess, steal some drugs and she went up a one way street and essentially she murdered him. And there was no type of really repercussions for what she'd done. I can't remember exactly what the settle was, but it's pretty much a slap on the wrist and the entire community was enraged. It was pretty big locally. And I remember when my parents let me and my siblings actually leave school early, which is like a no-no for them, to come to this protest. And it just felt so good on the inside. Everybody was all like amped up, but it was for a good cause. It wasn't to, it wasn't just rowdiness. It was more of like passion. And that's when I knew that this was what I wanted to do. So from then on, I became quite naturally more conscious and just more aware of the little subtle and hidden messages of racism that was projected onto the black community on a daily basis. I pretty much wouldn't let anything pass. My friends knew that even the most smallest situation I was going to address because it was a point that I had to prove that, you know, there are people who are willing to stand up and speak up for their community. And even if I'm the only one, then I'm going to stand up and speak up for my community. And it actually showed in my actions too. I would be very more selective about where I was shopping at. If I went into the store and you're watching over my back and you know, put yourself above me and I can tell that you're just in the community for the money and you don't even appreciate the customers, the customers coming in, then I would stop shopping there. I would inconvenience myself in that way. Um, it didn't matter if I was at work, at school, anywhere I was. It, my spirit literally would not let me just watch any type of racism or this discrimination, I couldn't witness it and just not speak up. I had to. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Then my big opportunity to be one of those black people that you read about in during the civil rights movement actually confronted me right before my eyes in 2012 when the Trayvon Martin story happened. And just with the lack of justice for black people in America, was being exposed in general, it just pretty much was when I felt like this is it. This is the civil rights movement. Um, there was a protest, I remember on Crenshaw Boulevard for Trayvon Martin and um, I went there. I forced my boyfriend at the time to go and it was one of those moments once again where you just feel good. We were on a freeway and it was just, it was craziness but it was standing up for something. It wasn't to cause trouble or to cause hayek it was pretty much to make them to get a point across to make a message and a good message that black lives do matter and that was pretty much when i felt like this is it this is my time i have to do it because if not me then who else a few years later the whole ferguson incident occurred 
This is where a young black man by the name of Michael Brown was fatally shot down by a police officer with his hands in the air saying, don't shoot for jaywalking. The community obviously was upset. They, he did this in the community with people standing there watching. So the community was outraged and they began protesting, which resonated a lot with me because I remember when I was a kid in my small community, we saw something happen that was wrong and we began to protest without anyone telling us have to. We just all decided to come together for a cause. So when I saw that in Ferguson, it initially just it, it struck a nerve with me. Except this time with Ferguson, their protests actually spread throughout the entire country and it brought awareness to something that has been swept under the rug for far too long. And when I found out that LA was having an outreach to Ferguson, I knew I had to be a part of that. And one day after work, I saw there was a protest and I just joined, I just straight off the work, no, not going home or anything. I just literally just hopped right in and I immediately became a part of the LA to Ferguson outreach in a significant way. I started making friends with people and I just immediately knew that it was my, this was my moment. I knew that this is why God put me on this earth to be a part of causes like these. And it didn't just stop with the protests. I literally became obsessed with this Elita Ferguson Black Lives Matter outreach to the point where me and a group of like-minded people, we started a group called the Underground World Road where we eventually had a contact list of about 70 to 80 people where we were all organizing strategies and ways to reach out to the community and let them to help them to realize how united, how unity holds power and how it's necessary in order to really create the type of change that people want to see. We would do all types of different things and one of the things we did was a discussion where we screened the film by Tariq Nashi, it's a documentary called Hidden Colors. We screened it and we had a discussion afterwards with people just to see, you know, where their minds were and to kind of just get the conversation started so that people can realize that there's a serious situation going on and we, we have to do something about it. And as fulfilling as <laughs> activism is, is obviously absolutely no money to be made in activism. And you do a lot of things that are physically draining and you're put in a lot of dangerous situations just for a cause that might never be recognized. I mean, there were times where I was literally hopping gates on a freeway, cops having guns sit at my face, and it was all just, you know, of the sacrifices that I had to make in order to prove my point that, you know, this matters to me, that I'm not just gonna let this thing happen, you know, even if I have to die. Is one of those situations where you have to be willing to sacrifice everything, your money, your life, and even your sanity. Because <laughs> there are situations within the activism community that is ironic to me where, you know, one person feels like they have to dominate over everyone else. And you would think that, you know, other activists would all come together and be like, hey, you know, so-and-so, this isn't right. But no, it's kind of the same thing. People don't speak up until that person directly offends them or does something that upset them, then that's when it becomes an issue. Because this human tendency, we tend to not feel like we can, if things bother us unless it's bothering us directly, which is just, it was an ironic to me and also I feel like a shame. There was even an incident where I was followed by two, I'm assuming FBI agents, but anyway, I'm on the, I'm on the bus, on the train, a girl by myself, and there's two strange guys who are follow, obviously following me to do God knows what because when I got off the train I just <laughs> went straight for my life but it was scary because it's like I'm just I'm just an ordinary girl you know to society so if something was to happen to me there is they had that they had that leverage to do anything they want and make it look however they want so that's one of the things where you have to really you know ask yourself am I willing to risk these type of things happening to me and ultimately you know I believe that I'm well I am willing to risk those things happening to me because when you stand for something that's it's all the way and it feels good to stand up for yourself alone but it feels even better to stand up for something that is greater for yourself and to inspire others to do the same Ultimately, 
ultimately my goal is to be a consistent activist within my black community and just to have an impact on the community as where we can raise to a, a level of that back in the day togetherness and sense of unity and pride where black people can see each other out in public and not know one another but still have that sense of responsibility for one another and just to know that that's my brother and my sister and we have one another's back, back and that we're proud of the heritage that we do share with one another. I want to have a nonprofit organization for young black girls in inner cities just to raise the self-esteem and the sense of pride in being a black woman in a society that is ultimately against the black woman and her feeling good about herself. I want black women to still know that you can be proud to be black and it doesn't make you a bad person to be proud to be black and being proud of yourself and seeing the beauty in that. I was on the Late Night Experiment with Motel Marie on season two, episode four. We were on this like reality TV data show thing going on and he was pretty much obsessed with his late night quest and how he's gonna take over the whole late night scene. Kind of how I'm obsessed with activism, except not on the first date. <laughs> yeah, he was pretty much, it was a great time. I loved laughing, so I, was, I laughed a lot. I had yogurt, and I really got a sense of his passion for late night. <laughs> all he kept talking about was late night television. That seems to be all he knows. I'm sorry, but that is a turn off. I'm gonna need him to lay off the late night crack. I can't do this. Mo Tamariz, you are excused. And you should watch the late night experiment with Mo Tamariz because it is full of passion. And trust me, I know a thing or two about passion <laughs> in many ways. But no, it is a great show. It's one of those shows that pretty much you're gonna get drug into his Chris Brown experience <laughs> and all that craziness. You gotta watch this show to find out. But you're definitely gonna laugh and you're definitely be gonna become a believer. You're gonna be anticipating the moment where you turn on your TV late night after a long day, kick your feet up and Motel Maurice is gonna have his own show. And you're gonna, it's one of those things you just paint the picture for you. So watch it. There once lived a man named Motown Maurice. His hair was tall and his ears were sleek. He's on a journey for late night TV. Subscribe and witness his story. Witness his story.